CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. Welcome to the universe... We have wonderful things for you to see. We have stars being born and galaxies exploding. We have spaceships plunging into the void and mysterious planets beckoning their crews to adventure. We have alien creatures, pitiless and pitiful, monsters, fierce and friendly, scientists, mad and sane. We have them all because you have your imagination and you can see wonders more wonderful than any movie screen can show. In fact, the story you're about to hear is about a movie screen, the strangest anyone has ever seen. Our mystery drama, The Movie Makers, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Henry Slesser and stars Marion Seldes and Norman Rose. Our story begins where some stories end, because a life has ended. The life of Dr. John Saville, a world-renowned physicist. The Saville theory of dual entropy will become standard among scientific principles, and for the next century, scientists will debate whether or not Dr. Saville's theory of space heat would have been proved valid if the great man had lived. But Dr. Saville is dead. His work lives on, his memory, and his widow. Please come in, Martin. Oh, thank you, Vera. But I really think you should go up and rest now. Funerals are very hard on the living. I must talk to you. Maybe you'll finally tell me the truth. About why I went to a funeral this morning. About why my husband shot himself. Oh, Vera. Don't give me that suffering look, Martin. Save it for your students. I know you'd like the whole world to believe it was nothing but a, an aberration on John's part, a momentary act of madness. He was overworked. John has been overworked all his life. But he loved being alive, and now suddenly he's dead. <laughs> oh, Vera. Why trouble yourself? Death is too solid a fact to question. I question this fact. Dear, uh, your husband was approaching the end of one of the most significant theorems in physics. And when he realized what it was he found, what terrible Pandora's box he was about to open... Yes, I've heard the stories that John felt guilty about his work when he realized its implication that his guilt drove him mad. And you don't believe that? No. No, I was married to him. I don't have to believe theories, Martin. I knew the man. But you know nothing about his theory, this space heat hypothesis. Do you realize what kind of military end could have evolved from it? Did you see the interview in Science? In Newsweekly with General Fletcher? A planet wrapped in flame. That's a horrifying thought, isn't it, Vera? And that was the thought John had with him for months now. I just don't believe it. You told me he'd leave the house frequently. But yes, every day, for hours. I don't know where he went. I still don't know. Uh, never mind. We have more practical things to talk about. Practical? Mm, legal things, Vera. We have to probate the will... Get John's papers together. We'll go over them tomorrow. You know where he kept everything? Yes. His wall safe. I have the combination. I'll open it tonight. Mm, you do that. And, um, Vera, don't think of the way John died. Think how he lived. <laughs> Left, 15, right, 13. There. Oh. Oh, so many papers. Well, they'll have to be sorted out. 
Let's see. Oh, here are the insurance policies. These must be his work notes. I have to give them to Martin. What's this? Another notebook with a rubber band around it. I wonder if John could have kept a diary. Something wrapped around this. A letter? Oh, I remember when this arrived. It was a Saturday morning. John always shared the mail with me, but this letter... He kept silent about, and I never did know why. Let me see. Dear Dr. Saville, your interest is kindly solicited in a unique proposition we would like to offer you. <laughs> a funny sort of sales letter. Unknown to you, and by means of a process hitherto thought impossible, our organization has been photographing your life since the date of your birth on October 2nd, 1921. As a scientist, you are certain to realize the enormous complexity of such a photographic undertaking and the amount of research it required to unearth the radical new concepts involved. We are offering private screenings of these films to the selected group of individuals upon whom we have been experimenting. We plan to limit these showings to one hour daily and are forced to charge a minimum fee of $100 per visit. The films will be projected at our own offices at 420 Oak Road, Carrington, Massachusetts, which is 18 miles north of Boston. If you are interested in a trial session, we would be pleased to have you call at our offices on Thursday of this week at 10 a.m. Good Lord, I wonder if John actually... Oh, wait, now there's more. There is one other consideration. We ask that you maintain complete secrecy about our organization. We are not yet ready to make our process public, and for this reason, we request that no one, not even your closest kin, be informed about the contents of this letter. Failure to comply will result in a withdrawal of this offer. Yours very truly, Howard Frank, Vice President, Life... Films Incorporated. But it has to have been some kind of hoax. How could such a thing be possible? I wonder if... if John's notebook... Let me see. The letter was dated the 5th. Thursday of that week would be... Here's the entry, yes. June the 9th. The first entry... The very first. This has, this been, has been an extraordinary, an extraordinary day, for me, day for me. And worthy of being and recorded being in a special recorded. journal. One hour ago, I returned from a small town called Carrington, some 18 miles from the city of Boston. I have spent this morning in a ramshackle frame house at the outskirts of town, whose interior has been converted into a modern office-like arrangement of some four rooms. And in one of those rooms... I have been watching myself as a youth of 27 attending a small gathering at the home of a man who has been dead for 10 years. I realize that I am writing this with unscientific detachment, but this experience has shaken my soul like dice in a gambler's cuff. I will try to start at the beginning. Yes? Uh, hello, my name is Saville. Would that be Dr. Saville of the university? That's right. Uh, am I talking to Mr. Frank? Uh, no, doctor. Uh, my name is David Morrison. Uh, Mr. Frank is in his office. He's been expecting you. Ah, Dr. Saville. How nice of you to be so prompt. Please, sit down. Uh, thank you. Well, what did you think of my letter? Well, let's say I found it very intriguing. Ah, uh, yes, but of course... You're also skeptical. I'll have to admit that I am. I really cannot see how it's possible to... to photograph a man's life without being observed. Well, I can think of only one way to prove that our offer was genuine. 
We'll have to demonstrate. This way, Doctor. Oh, yes. Now, this is our, uh, our projection room. If you'll just take a seat. Oh, I'm sorry about the darkness. Oh, thank you. Mm. Well, I'm, I'm afraid I don't see any screen. Oh, you'll see it on the facing wall, Doctor, just as soon as we leave. Now, just make yourself at home. All we need to know is what period of your life you'd be most interested in seeing. Are you... Are you telling me seriously that you have movies of my life? Yes, Dr. Saville. Movies of your life. Your whole life. Would you like to start in childhood? Oh, but that's impossible. Watch the screen, Dr. Saville. my father, but so young, it just can't be. Please, please. Now try to think of some specific event you'd like to see. The more specific, the better. All right, but I don't know the exact day. It was around the middle of May in the year 1946. It was the day I first met my wife, Vera. Do you think that you could locate that exact film? Of course. It won't be any trouble. It was a small party at the home of a Mr. Hugh Donato, a colleague of mine at the university. Dead now. It will take just a few minutes. Now, just relax. I'm sure we'll have no trouble finding the exact film. They left me alone then. I still was not certain that I wasn't the victim of some elaborate student prank. And yet, I could have sworn that for one moment I saw my father's face on that screen before me. And then the screen started to glow once more. A brilliant whiteness painful to my eyes. But then, the colors began to appear. The screen held a picture of a room I hadn't seen in 30 years. It was Hugh Donato's living room. Beyond any doubt, the same room. I couldn't fail to recognize that big, ugly square room with its incongruous walls of wood paneling and flowered wallpaper. There were people in the room. Old Hugh himself, looking not a day over 30. And his wife, Deborah. And Professor Mills, the old windbag. And Jane Anderson. What a handsome woman she was before. And then I, I realized I could actually hear their voices. I leaned forward eagerly to hear them. But I heard nothing. Because suddenly I saw her standing by the bay window, standing there quietly in isolation. A young girl in a gray cashmere sweater looking lost and lovely and supremely wonderful. My eyes filled with tears when I saw Vera, my wife, unchanged by time's treachery. And then I saw myself. I was speaking to her and she was replying. I know. You're Professor Seville. <laughs> No, hardly. I'm just a teacher, not even an associate professor. Oh, I'm sorry. I... It's all right. I decided that I'd rather be called doctor. Who ever heard of an absent-minded doctor? <laughs> doctor as in MD? No, no, as in physics, actually. Uh, by the way, did you tell me your name yet? It's Peterson. Vera Peterson. I'm in vocational guidance. Do you know that you're squinting, Vera Peterson? What? You are definitely squinting at me. Well... I don't know what you mean. Look, I've seen you around the university, and I happen to remember that you wear glasses. Where are they now? Oh, well, they're in my purse, if you really want to know. Well, I think you ought to wear them. You do? Certainly. How else can you know what I look like? I might be a veritable Mr. Hyde, for all you know. Instead of Dr. Jekyll. <laughs> <laughs> Go on, put your glasses on. I might have just the impudent charm you like. All right, I will. There. You know something, Miss Peterson? You should never worry about wearing those glasses. I mean, all the time. Nothing in the world could hide the beauty of your eyes. Can it really be true? Did John really see these things? Let's see what's on the next page. It wasn't until I was back on the highway, heading for home, that the full impact of what had occurred struck me. I knew that I had just witnessed a great scientific mystery, a secret which my scientist's mind should have coveted. 
Yet all I could think about was the personal side of my discovery. And even as I write these words, I am trembling with impatience for my next visit to Life Films Incorporated. Well, everybody loves the movies. But can you imagine what it would be like to star in your own life story? Would you see yourself as hero or villain? Your life as a comedy or tragedy? How did Dr. John Savile see himself? And what was the effect of his strange movie-going habits? We'll find out when we return shortly with Act Two. Vera Savile, widow of the renowned scientist Dr. John Savile, sits in the dim study in which her husband had spent long hours studying the mysteries of the universe and ponders another mystery, a strange journal left to her as a legacy from her husband, a journal which tells the incredible story John Savile had kept secret from her. June the 22nd. Shall I tell Vera what I have seen? Shall I jeopardize this opportunity to relive my life in the strangest of all possible ways. I am caught up in an inner conflict that cries out for resolution. How have they performed this miracle? What wizardry has allowed them to put on film my every living deed without my knowledge? How can I, a scientist, not demand to know the answer? And And yet... I cannot. I am so deeply entangled in the net they have cast that I lack the will to do anything. Every hour I have spent in the Carrington projection room has been infinitely precious to me. The past has become more real and more important to me than the present. Today, for instance, I I spent an hour on a train with my father. I was on a transcontinental Pullman sitting in the dining car, watching the towns and farms of America flash by the window. My father had some interesting tale or legend to recount about everything we saw, for his engineering work had given him the opportunity to know every state in the Union with a hometown familiarity. I remember how fascinated I had been by his stories when I was 14. That was the age of my trip. And how sad I was to realize now what a terrible old bore my father was. What a stuffy, pompous, wonderful old bore. How could I surrender such delights, even in the name of science? Come in, Dr. Seville. How are you today? I'm, I'm very well, thank you. Uh, Mr. Frank, Dr. Seville is here. Well, hello, doctor. Come right inside. We've been waiting for you. Yes, yes, thank you. I've located those films you asked for. The dinner at the Waldorf Astoria. You did say the award date was September the 10th? Yes, yes, that was the date. Now, I I admit I feel a bit foolish about wanting to see myself uh, given tributes. I didn't realize I had so much ego. Uh, But it's perfectly natural, Doctor, to receive such an honored prize. You must have been very proud. Oh, no, no, I I didn't feel pride at the time. I felt uh, embarrassed having all that attention showered on me. I would have much rather been at home in my study or in a classroom. But, uh, for some reason, now I would like to see it all again. It must be old age. You are not an old man, Dr. Seville. There are many things in your life yet to come, I am sure. But you're not photographing me now, are you? The, the, The process isn't continuing. No, no, Doctor. Our experiment is over. Now all you have to do is enjoy it. And I did enjoy it. I have to admit the truth. I sat in the darkness of that projection room and watched the world pay me tribute. And Lord help me, how I relished it all. How Vera would have laughed to see me. Poor 
Vera. I know that my movie-going days are causing her great worry. My unexplained disappearances. And even worse, my diminishing interest in my work. The space heat theory is so close to completion. It would be unforgivable to allow my efforts to lag because of my need for... Well, for pictures of my life. John, you must see a doctor. You haven't seen one for months. I don't need a doctor, Vera. There's nothing wrong with me. John... I talked to Dr. Khan about you. Khan? You know what kind of doctor he is, Vera. Yes. Ah, oh, I see. You think that I'm uh, going a little funny? No, of course I don't think that. But you know yourself that... Well, you've changed. Your habits are different and... You're having problems at the university, aren't you? Well, yes, I suppose I am. Some problems, nothing serious. Well, Martin tells me... Well, go on. What did Martin say? Something about a disability you have. Well, it's true. Something strange has happened to me, Vera. I cannot explain it. I'm sure that it's only temporary. Please tell me, John. Vera, I, I seem to have forgotten some basics. It's very strange. Sometimes I feel like some poor C student struggling with the intricacies of calculus. In fact, there are well, there are times when even simple arithmetic seems beyond me. Then, is that why you haven't been working? Well, it may be part of it, but... But, Vera, please don't worry. I, I'm going to start again. I have an idea about how to start again. Yes, I had an idea. You might call it an inspiration. Didn't the files of Life Films Incorporated contain every waking hour of my life? Watching the films, why couldn't I quickly reorient myself to the foundations of my work? It would be a refresher course, and I would be my own instructor. This morning, I viewed the scene in my study when I first glimpsed the secret of space heat. The blackboard covered with equations was a friendly sight, and as I studied it eagerly, a sense of elation came over me. But when I arrived home and made myself a makeshift lunch at 2 p.m., the terrible truth struck me. It had all been so clear on that screen in the projection room, but now, sitting in that quiet kitchen, the film seemed like a long-forgotten dream, a hazy memory from the distant past. The cosmic sense of all I had seen on that blackboard had become... had become meaningless. I could recall nothing. Absolutely nothing. September 13th. I did not go to Carrington today. The effort was monumental. I left the house as usual, not wanting the change in my routine to be noticed by Vera. Instead, I drove the car through the countryside in an effort to clear my clouded brain. The attempt was unsuccessful. I could think of nothing but that narrow room at Carrington. I craved the comfort of that armchair and screen, the way an addict must crave his narcotic. Those hours now are essential to my existence. I must have them at any cost. September the 14th. My mother was a beautiful woman. I've always thought so, and now I'm sure of it. She was like some golden angel with long blonde hair and gentle hands. She died when I was only five, but I've spent an unforgettable hour with her on this, my birthday. Even now, locked in my study, while Vera pleads with me on the other side of the door, my eyes are full of tears. Why can't they leave me alone, my so-called friends? Martin, it's the only way. I asked Dr. Khan to come to the house tonight just to observe John, to tell me what he thinks. Well, it won't work, Vera. You can't treat an unwilling patient. Oh, I don't want him to start treating him. I want him to tell me what's wrong. Oh, no, Vera, no doctor will make a diagnosis on this basis. Well, I'm surprised Dr. Khan agreed to all this. Oh, he, he doesn't really know. I just asked him for dinner. 
He's met John before, you know. He's met him at least a dozen times at those award dinners. Yeah, and... I still say it's the wrong way to solve the problem. You must convince John to see someone, convince him that there's a need. But I've tried that, and I've failed. I've got to try something else. Well, what are you two conspiring about? Uh, evening, John. Uh, how are you feeling tonight? I feel fine. Shall I take my temperature for your benefit? Oh, really, John? I'm sorry, Martin. It's just that I've become so sick and tired of people asking me how I am. Martin, you can stay for dinner, can't you? Well, I uh, really don't think I can. Please, uh, please. You've got to stay. Well, of course, Martin. Why not? I'm not really good company at dinner, as Vera will tell you. It'll be much nicer if we're a threesome. It will be a foursome, John. Four? I invited someone else, a, another old friend. There he is now. Excuse oh, but, me. But, Vera. Please come in, doctor. Did, did she say doctor? Well, it's starting to rain a bit, I'm sorry to say. Let me take your coat. <laughs> well, I never did learn the art of remembering my umbrella. Well... <clears throat> Good evening. Oh, hello, Victor. Yes, Martin, how nice to see you. And you, John? John, you remember Dr. Victor Kahn, of course. No. No, I'm afraid I don't. Well, something tells me you're surprised to see me here, John. I uh, heard my wife say that you're a doctor. Well, you know Dr. Kahn is a psychiatrist. Well, in fact, the uh, two of you shared the same award last year, remember? No. No, I don't. I don't remember anything about it. And frankly, I don't see why I should share my dinner table with a stranger. John, how can you say that? I'm sure that you have regular consulting hours, Doctor. I don't intend to consult you on my dinner hour. Now, if you'll excuse me. Uh, 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 John, uh, wait. I uh, think there's a misunderstanding. I, I thought we'd become friends. Friends? I never saw you before in my life. October the 6th. It's the last entry. The last page. October the 6th. My hand is shaking. I can barely write these words. Today I have had terrible news. I cannot believe it. I'm sorry, Dr. Seville, but I'm afraid we cannot show you a film today. Mm -hmm. Not show me... But, but why? I, I had the money. I, I am really very sorry. You see, the projection room has been dismantled. What? But, but why? Is there some problem, something that has to be repaired? It's been dismantled, Doctor. What does that mean? I'm afraid that you will not be able to continue your visits here. This business has become, well, unprofitable for us. Oh, but I'll, I'll pay you more. It doesn't have to be only a hundred dollars. I can raise more money, I promise you. It isn't that simple. But why are you doing this? Tell me. We we're very grateful for your patronage, Dr. Seville. Believe me. But our experiment is over. It isn't fair. It's just not fair. There are a thousand things I want to see. Please, I beg you not to do this. I beg you. Martin, thank you. Uh, I'm just uh, <clears throat> calling to find out if you located all of John's papers. Yes, I... I have them. Everything we discussed was in his wall safe. Oh, good. I'm glad to hear it. Uh, now, uh, what time would you like me to come over tomorrow? Tomorrow? Well, I have classes in the afternoon. C can we make it in the morning? No, uh, no Martin. It won't be possible. Oh, why not? I... I won't be here tomorrow. I'm going somewhere. Where? Your sister, you, you said you wouldn't leave for at least a month. We'll just have to make it another time, Martin. I'm, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Very well, Vera. Goodbye. Goodbye. Now, what was that address again? Oh, here it is. Life Films, Incorporated, 420 Oak Road, Carrington, Massachusetts. So, Mrs. John Savile has decided to follow the same trail her husband followed. What will she find there? An answer? Or perhaps more tragedy? We'll find out exactly what happens at 420 Oak Road when we return shortly with Act Three. 
It's a cold, crisp day in autumn. A day for visiting the countryside to see the blazing colors of the leaves before their fall. But the eyes of Vera Saville behind the wheel of her car seem to see nothing but the road ahead. Even as she drives, her mind is full of doubts that she will find anything at all at 420 Oak Road, either because its occupants have moved on or because those occupants had never been there. Yes? Pardon me, I... I'm looking for a place called Life Films Incorporated. Oh, I'm sorry. You must have the wrong address. No, Um, I'm sure it's the right place, but perhaps the firm is no longer located here. I'm sorry. I I really can't help you. Oh, wait, please. I'm Mrs. Seville. My husband was Dr. John Seville. You know his name, don't you? I am afraid not. Please don't shut the door. Uh, What is it, David? Is there a Mr. Frank here? Mr. Thomas Frank? Uh, Yes. Yes, my name is Frank, Mrs. Saville. Let the lady in, David. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, come this way, Mrs. Saville. Please, sit down. Uh, No. I'd prefer to stand, thank you. I really think you would be better off. This chair is quite comfortable. Very well. Now, tell me what we can do for you. Mrs. Seville. I know what you're thinking. Pardon? You're thinking that John disobeyed your instructions, but you're wrong. He never told me about you or about this place. He he kept a journal, a record of his visits here, and I found it after his death. You have our deepest sympathies, Mrs. Seville. Your, Your husband was a great man. Thank you. You should know, of course. You should know everything about John. Mrs. Seville... I've read about your movies. It's difficult to believe that such a thing can be done. But as the wife of a scientist, I have more liberal ideas, perhaps, concerning what is possible. Yes, yes. Many things are possible, Mrs. Seville. No one knew that better than your husband. He was a brilliant man. But what he accomplished in his lifetime was no greater than your own achievement. Oh, we we did not invent the life film process, ma'am. We are merely, um, salesmen. Ah, well, you have an amazing product to sell. Truly amazing. A filmed record of one's own life. Very ingenious. But in this case, your ingenuity killed my husband. Oh, we cannot believe that, Mrs. Seville. You did. Read his journal. Read it and you'll see. These films of yours destroyed him. They destroyed his will. They were like a drug to him, like an addictive drug. And then you... You cut them off. You stopped them and he couldn't bear it and he killed himself. That wasn't the case. It's the truth. Read the last entry. The pain he felt. Knowing that he could no longer... Visit his past. See his life relived. Mrs. Seville... You must hear our side of the story. I know you're overwrought, but we deserve a hearing. Yes, that's why I've come. I want to know how you can justify what you've done. Very well. The first thing you have to know is that there are no films. What did you say? We are not movie makers. There has been no photographic record of your husband's life. But his journal... Things are not always what they seem. Our people have learned many things, but this is not one of them. Your people? Who are they? It is true that your husband saw his past, Mrs. Seville. Just as he says in his journal. But the method was something different from what he thought. It had to be. And we couldn't tell him the truth for fear uh, that he would reveal our purpose. What purpose? The purpose of life, Mrs. Seville. Your husband was on the verge of an important discovery. A discovery that the people of our world have been aware of for many centuries. Your world? Oh, no. 
not going to believe it. You're going to sit there and tell me that you're from some other planet, that you're aliens. It will be the truth. But that's not possible. I want the real truth. Not some idiotic fairy tale. It is only the truth. We are from a planet of a sun, not too distant from yours. Someday, perhaps, your people will reach us just as we have reached you. And when that day comes, if you come in peace, we will greet you in peace. But what has this to do with my husband? We are given to the long view of things, Mrs. Seville. That's why we were sent here. To prevent your husband's theory from being born before its time. Before the people of your world were able to cope with its, its dangers. We had to stop him. You mean to kill him? Is that what you were planning to do? Kill my husband? No, 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 Mrs. Seville. We are forbidden to take life. There are laws in your world which also forbid it, but those laws are only in your preachings. Our law is integrated in our minds and bodies and, and souls. Oh, I see. So you arranged for him to kill himself? No, no, that was not our intention. We deeply regret this tragic outcome. Please, please believe us, Mrs. Saville. All we wanted to do was to make your husband forget. But how? By destroying his mind? We hope to have him forget only enough to make completion of his work impossible. Ah, uh, yes. Come with me, Mrs. Seville. I want, I want to show you our projection room. Come in. Come in, Mr. Seville. Well, it's... It's just as he described it. Uh, yes, yes. This is where your husband watched scenes from his past, but not on films, Mrs. Seville. We have evolved a method for producing from one's own mind the stored images of memory. I can assure you, the principles involved are more complex than your husband's space heat theory. Memory. Then John only remembered what he saw. Oh, the mind forgets nothing. There is a storehouse in our brains that keeps its treasures until some outside force brings them to light once again. We have discovered that force, that light, if you will. And through it, Dr. Seville rediscovered his past. It was a wondrous experience for him. But we expected to be repaid. And you don't mean money? No. We were repaid in another kind of coin. The coin of forgetfulness. The effort of extracting the past is a great one. The price is memory itself. Each hour your husband viewed in this room would later be forgotten by him in its entirety no matter how hard he tried to recall it. Then you did destroy his mind. In the interests of peace, Mrs. Saville. And then when you were through with him, you tossed the empty shell aside. We did what had to be done. And what will you do now? We will return home. Our task on Earth is ended for now. And what will I do now? John was everything to me. To you, he was nothing more than an assignment. Something you had to attack and destroy. <laughs> but he was my husband in my life. Oh, believe me, Mrs. Saville. We wish there was something we could do. Well, there is. There is. Anything, Mrs. Saville. Just tell us what you wish. I want... to see a film. <laughs> that you're squinting, Vera Peterson? What? You are definitely squinting at me. I don't know what you mean. Look, I've seen you around the university, and I happen to remember that you wear glasses. Where are they now? Oh, well, 
They're in my purse, if you really want to know. I think you ought to wear them. You do? Certainly. How else can you know what I look like? I might be a veritable Mr. Hyde, for all you know. Instead of Dr. Jekyll? <laughs> <laughs> Go on. Put your glasses on. I might have just the impudent charm you like. All right, I will. There. Well, what do you think? Well, you're not Mr. Hyde. But I don't know about the impudent charm. You know something, Miss Peterson? You should never worry about wearing those glasses. I mean all the time. Nothing in the world could hide the beauty of your eyes. Yes, you've guessed it. You've just heard a love story. But why not? Is there anything more wonderful, marvelous, or mysterious than love? We suspect that it is one earthly phenomenon that man will take with him and her to the outer planets. That romance will follow the rocket ships. That valentines will be sent on Venus. That wedding rings will be worn on the rings of Saturn. I'll be back shortly. Delta Airlines. Say, does Delta fly to Atlanta? Yes, sir. Delta has the most non-stops to Atlanta. Nine every day, plus eight one-stop through jets. Well, better give them all to me. Yes, sir. Here goes. 7.20 a.m., rise and shine. The 8.20 flight is next in line. There's another breakfast flight at 9. Then come flights at 11.05, 11.30, and 12.25. The next flight takes off at 1.10, and close behind, the 2 p.m. There's a 2.40 flight and a 3.30, too. Or maybe the 4 is just right for you. The 4 40 jet is a big tri star, and the 625 is popular. At half past six, another flight, then the 725 comes into sight. A tri star night coach at 9 p.m., and another at 2.45 a.m., and then we do it all again. Wow, that was terrific. You're sure to have a good time on Delta to Atlanta, Jacksonville, Daytona Beach, all the South. Hey, I had a good time just calling. Delta is ready when you are. This is WBBM Chicago. Speaking of love and science fiction, have you ever heard about the Hollywood producer who plotted his first science fiction movie? Boy meets girl, boy loses girl, boy builds girl. Well, that might not be the next story you will hear on Mystery Theater, but we do promise you an earful of wonders, marvels, and mysteries that will bring the future as close as the speaker on your radio. Our cast included Marion Seldes, Norman Rose, Russell Horton, and Earl Hammond. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams.